This is Epicenter, episode 316 with guest Luca Mueller. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Couture. Today, our guest is Luca Mueller. Luca is a founding partner at MME. Now, if MME doesn't sound particularly familiar, you're most definitely familiar with their work because they were a crucial player in several token sales which took place starting in 2014, including the most notable one, the Ethereum token sale. So Luca tells the story of when a handful of techies and engineers walked into his office in 2014 looking for counsel and guidance on how to raise money for Ethereum, but also how to set up the foundational governance structure, the legal structure that would become the Ethereum Foundation. Frederica and Brian did this interview, and having both been part of companies that have raised money through token sales, I thought they were very well placed and prepared to have this conversation with Luca. So they talked about a number of things, like why Switzerland was, and in many ways still is, a favorable jurisdiction for token sales, the Swiss foundation model that so many projects and platforms have adopted, the differences between Switzerland and the US in terms of regulation and contrasting that with regulation in other European jurisdictions. And they also talked about Signum, a new digital asset bank co-founded by Luca. I really enjoyed this interview because it takes us back to the early days of Ethereum and there's a lot of great insights and lessons there which are still very relevant today in the current regulatory context. Before we go to the interview, I'd like to tell you about our sponsors for today's episode, starting with a brand new sponsor that I'm really excited to have on the show, and that is eToro. Now, if you're a listener of the podcast, you've certainly heard of eToro since we had the CEO, Yanni Asia, on the, on the show a couple of weeks ago. And when researching that episode, I thought, you know, I'll, I'll try this thing out. So I created an account and deposited some money and I've been using it, and I really like it. One of the greatest things about eToro is the social trading aspect and the copy trader feature. The way that this works is when you create your account, you're presented with eToro's top traders. You'll see their investment strategy, the history of their trades over time, how their portfolio has performed, and eToro also evaluates their risk profile on a scale of one to six from low to high. So when you copy a trader, your profits or losses will mirror those of the trader proportional to your investment. So for example, if the trader has a $10,000 investment and they make 10% returns over the year, if you copied that trader with $100, you will also make that 10%, so $10. So by copying other traders, there's a lot less time and effort required to studying the markets and building your own strategies. But what's really cool for trading noobs like myself is that I've learned a lot by copying other people and I'm starting to think about my own strategies. So I hope to tell you about that experience over the next couple of weeks. What I also like about eToro is that I get exposure to stocks, indices, commodities, currencies, ETFs, and also crypto in one single platform. So to create your account today, go to eToro.com, that's E-T-O-R-O.com, and build your portfolio, your crypto portfolio, your stock portfolio, your commodities portfolio, whatever kind of portfolio you want to build, build it the smart way. I'd like to thank eToro for their support of the podcast. And now for the obligatory disclosures as required by U.S. regulators. This is my personal opinion. It is not trading or investment advice. Investments involve risk. eToro does not guarantee returns or performance. Cryptocurrencies are highly volatile. Please be aware of the risk while trading them. We're also brought to you by Cosmos. And I want to tell you about an important change that's coming to the Cosmos Network very soon. On December 11th, the Cosmos Network is due to upgrade from Hub 2 to Hub 3. As you know, Cosmos Network has an internal governance system. And over the last few months, a number of proposals have passed and will be added in this new hard fork. So there's four governance proposals that we'll be making into this hard fork. First is the community fund which was approved and will allow governance to spend funds from the community pool. There's also a change to how 
deposits on vetoed proposals are burned, their security updates, and also an increase in the max validator set size. They're going from 100 to 125 validators. So this is all very exciting and it shows blockchain governance at work and it's a, it's a great thing to see. So for more on that and to stay informed with everything that's going on with Cosmos, go to cosmos.network, scroll to the bottom of the page and sign up for the newsletter. And while you're there, also go to cosmos.network slash G-O-Z to learn more about Game of Zones, which is the adversarial testnet challenge for the upcoming IBC protocol implementation. We'd like to thank Cosmos for their support of the podcast. And with that, here is Frederica and Brian's interview with Luca Mueller. So we're here today with Luca Mueller. Luca is the co-founder and a partner at MME. So MME is a law firm in Zug. And maybe many people haven't heard of MME, but you certainly would have heard of some of the projects that and some of the work that MME has done. They played a really crucial role when it comes to sort of ICOs and uh, crowdfunding in crypto, uh, doing work back then with the original work with the Ethereum Foundation on the Ethereum token sale and later with many, many other projects. So really, and then Lucas has been since then involved in lots of different projects from, you know, starting a bank, which we're going to speak about, to working on, on many different regulatory issues, to working with different startups. So... Thanks so much for joining us today, Luca. Thank you. So maybe let, let's start at the beginning. What was life like, you know, once upon a time before all this blockchain stuff came along? Like, how did you spend your days? Oh, Brian, I had much more free time. I tell you, it was, uh, <laughs> I, I, all at that time I was working quite a lot. You know, lawyers always are busy, but the blockchain uh, really changed my life. Not only because it got me really hooked on, but also uh, the, the, the amount, the in incredible amount of, of work and f also from an intellectual point, not easy work, was uh, as from 2014 for me life-changing. You were involved in fintech even before blockchain, right? Yes, I did. Uh, I was actually um, in the whole um, platform economy already since uh, 1999. I worked for several um, startups at the the west coast of the US, Silicon Valley, we had uh, also, and it was, I was really had to laugh when I was looking back into my files. Already in 2001, we had a, or we had a project to issue shares on a web interface, which did not work because at that time, you know, that was too revolutionary. So I advised the, whatever had a context to digital transaction and law, that was my topic. So the beginning was uh, e-economy, then uh, transfer of protected info or secure information uh, via a uh, web or internet infrastructure, payment services, banking services, and uh, always also with an eye and the speciality on a AML, anti-money laundering and compliance. So that's actually why I actually surfed into the next wave blockchain. So... How did that happen? I, I kind of imagine Vitalik and the rest of the Ethereum founders marching into your office and explaining what they were setting out to do. Can you tell us the story of how that happened? Yes, I can, can tell you. They walked in in February 2014 in my office and started to talk about decentralized concept blockchain, Bitcoin and the uh, like and uh, Bitcoin version 2.0. And I was sweating because normally I, I understood digital infrastructures, but I had no idea, really no idea at that time what they were talking about. And uh, interesting uh, to say is that I think it was Charles Hodgkinson, he said, you know, uh, Luca, I mean, I see that you uh, you have certain um, know-how in the field, but you need to have a reading. And he sent me a link of a very interesting publication, which was is issued in 2013 in the U.S., describing the Bitcoin protocol. And I was amazed about two things. First, that this paper was really good, really good, very easy to read, gave a very good explanation of the basics of a Bitcoin protocol. And secondly, you know, in the US, they were already writing such comprehensive papers, while Switzerland was at that time, you know, in a deep crypto sleep. 
you know, nobody was actually really dealing with it. So that was, I was amazed by it. It's kind of a mixed crowd, right? So basically it's Charles Wilson and Joe Dixon and Vitalik and Gavin Wood. What did you make of them? So, I mean, it must have been funny view for the outside, having all of them sitting in your lawyer's office, right? I tell you, at that time, I did not really uh, think that they were so, uh, I, I mean, famous blockchain person sitting around uh, in my meeting room. At, at the beginning, they were more like nerd, nerd type, all highly intelligent, uh, all with their special character uh, in their t-shirts, normally coming directly from a flight, some from somewhere, you know, flying economy class, sweating, uh, running into my office. Yes, it was a crowd of tech guys trying to explain me what they want to achieve. And for me, it was at the beginning, I had to really to read in to, ex to understand. And, you know, then, then Vitalik showed me his uh, white paper. I was completely lost. I did not understand a single word at the beginning. So I was forced to read in. And these guys, they helped me a lot. And I had really, for me, it was a chance that I could work with them to understand what would be the an adequate structure to launch a decentralized open source public protocol, which at that time was not known apart from the Bitcoin protocol to the world. How did they end up, for example, coming to you and coming to Switzerland and the idea of creating a foundation, was that your idea or how did that idea first come up? Very good question. I'm asking myself, you know, who really had the idea? And I think we all were working on a structure. Uh, first, we thought that it might be a typical AG or GmbH, but then it was particularly Vitalik uh, who was very strong on this point that he said a public protocol should not have an owner. And so we were searching uh, to what kind of structure we could apply a structure which works like a smart contract. You know, it has a predefined structure, a predefined functionality. You can load such a functionality with assets and the assets will be used according to the predefined purpose. And so that was, that was the way why we came up with a foundation structure, which has no owner, which Contrary to the U.S. structure, is a legal personality, very solid, an old structure, and very difficult as a smart contract, very difficult to change. So we then, after about four months of consideration, we decided it might be the best way to set up a foundation as, let's say, as a governance structure element to launch and to maintain and to support such a protocol, not only for the initial launching process, but also for the whole operation of such a protocol. I think having a foundation has tremendously benefited Ethereum as a project. And I understand why they would seek you out, given that they were going to do this in Switzerland. But how did they settle on Switzerland as a jurisdiction to set up this foundation in? As far as I remember, they already made a search on different jurisdictions. Switzerland was only one of them. What they particularly loved is first that the Switzerland had a very solid legal framework, a long-standing DNA of decentralized way of living and creating laws and operating. So that's what they always mentioned. You know, this, we are actually in a country which has in their political DNA already decentralization. And yes, I think that was one of the reasons why they finally ended up in Switzerland. And so I, I guess at the time already, I mean, I remember a little bit back then that securities law was, was a concern. Is that also something that you investigated and looked? And how, how did you look at sort of the, this from an international perspective and from the perspective of, you know, potential securities laws around the token sale? Of course, we had to, uh, to make an analysis. What is it really? What we are going to do? What kind of potential laws would apply? And, you know, as a Swiss law firm, we could only advise on Swiss law and that we were quite clear. So listen, 
I mean, we can advise on Swiss law, how it works on Swiss law, but, you know, we don't know how it is in other countries. So if you have any activities or if you intend to, let's say, to market your product somewhere else, you have to be aware that there might be other laws which which will be applicable. And uh, for the team was, you know, was specifically the US was a concern. I think only the US was a concern. And uh, we were looking at for, we had uh, advice in the US. And, you know, at that time, you can imagine there were 2014. It was also for the US lawyers, very difficult to assess what we really have here. What is a protocol access? How do you launch such a protocol, you know? It was difficult to say to what extent really, and it still is. I mean, it's not solved yet, you know. As we can see, five years later, it's not solved what it really is. Does Do the U.S. security legislation really apply? Uh, and when do they apply and when not? So, yes, uh, if, you ha- if you launch such a, a protocol, because it's a national project, other jurisdictional aspects needs to be considered and can be relevant. Yeah, and I'm curious, maybe you can go into a little bit because the, I, I guess after the Ethereum uh, fundraiser, of course, it ended up being a big success and then Ethereum launched. I guess it was around two years later, maybe after the Ethereum fundraiser that it started sort of happening with the entire ICO craze that in the end ended up becoming massive. Tell us a little bit about your involvement there, like, you know, what kind of, and, you know, we, we worked together also a little bit on Cosmos side, which you also did. So yeah, share us a bit. Like, how was what was that like from your perspective? What are some of the projects you're involved in? You know, how many did you work with? Yeah, you know, just the term ICO. You know, at the time when we launched Ethereum, nobody was talking about ICOs, and actually, I never liked this term ICO. Never ever. This is a term, and I I hardly ever use it. You know. Because it's also a misleading term. A ICO as such as a type does not exist. There are some common denominators. You can say this could be, let's say, something which you could say this is a common base of an ICO. But there's so many different types, so many different types of launching projects. And some of them, you know, looking back now, are, I would say they are clearly, yeah, securities, especially under the US law, but also on the Swiss law. But the really, really, some of the really old and decentralized launches, which we did, were clearly not. And so back to your question, you know, we did, I myself, I did not very much uh, of such launches. I concentrated only on protocol or on application protocol launches. So I did not many, I would say five, six, but the big ones. And uh, I always, uh, when, when I said, you know, I will I participate in a launch, it was always a protocol launch, always. Which other protocols did you launch? Cosmos, uh, then uh, it was Tesos, it was uh, Ethereum. I need to have the list in front of me, I'm getting old. <laughs> Cardano. <laughs> now Cardano, we did not do the Cardano, we just uh, helped them at the end uh, to set up their structure. So I assume you learned a lot in the last six years. So, I mean, obviously, it's been almost six years since they marched into your office. If you had to do it again today, you know, like six years later, would you do anything differently? Good question. I would probably do one thing a bit more differently or two things. Uh, I would still use the foundation structure for me, still the most adequate structure for a decentralized open source launch of a protocol. That's, uh, I would not change that. What I would actually have a little bit more, as I'd say, a better eye on is, as I said, two things. One is I would uh, draft the internal governance rules a bit more detailed than we did in the beginning. So let's say version one foundation was very simple and also the internal governance structure was simple. Here I would invest more time. I would invest more time and I would also propose to the teams, to the core teams, guys, listen, spend a little bit more money. You know, these young guys, you know, say, no, we don't have money for these, li- these technical things, you know, legal stuff, you know, we know what we do and things like this. But, you know, here, they were all young guys, you know, and I would more fathering or grandfathering them to say, listen, guys, even if you're young, young and believe in, in your decentralized world, add a little bit more structure to your idea. One thing. 
Secondly, since you have a foundation structure, the appointment of the uh, foundation council is very important. So here I would suggest to the core team that they are very carefully choosing who sits on the board of such a foundation, because this is paramount. So these were the two things, more structure, more governance structure, and really be very careful in choosing who you appoint as a board member in your foundation. Yeah, and I guess that probably both sound very pertinent, especially to the whole Tezos episode, right? Where it seems like they were basically in some sort of deadlock for, I don't know, six months, nine months, or maybe it was longer, uh, and could basically, or were paralyzed, you know, since the, there was this fight going on between the, the president of the board and then the Tezos founders. Yeah, absolutely. But do you still think like today, let's say uh, some, the, the next Ethereum comes along, you know, s similar ambitions, you would again advise them to use a foundation structure or, or what, what are the biggest differences in terms of how one would today go about launching sort of a project with those ambitions? If you intend to launch a protocol as Ethereum, the same way you want to have an open source decentralized community, I think the foundation is still the most adequate structure you can choose. However, you know, if you just change a little bit, you add some centralized elements in your project, then you might uh, consider to use a, another structure like an AG or a GmbH. But coming back to your question, if you want to launch, again, something like Ethereum, I would do it in a foundation. I would still use the foundation. So token sales have become somewhat unpopular in the last one or two years. What's your take on this development? I think because some of the token sales were really not protocol launches, but were, yes, they were sales of securities for which you need the, uh, especially in the US, uh, special approvals. And that got a bit too expensive. And also what they underestimated that if they launch a token, which is considered as a security, the tradability of such a token is very limited because all the trading venues, exchanges would need to have another license to, to deal, to actually exchange and to trade such tokens. That really was, was getting clearer and clearer to some of the projects. And that was a, that was a reason why some of the projects said, you know, can we launch it in a way as a decentralized open source project? And that, for us, we say, no, if it's not a project like Ethereum, for example, then it's not, then it's another project and find another adequate structure. And if it is a security token, it's a security token. You cannot change it just if you just by naming it a little bit differently. And I think this was one of the uh, drawbacks, you know, that you said, okay, if you look really clearly to one, some of the structures, they were securities and that uh, you, the market learned that it's more difficult to launch a security token. Secondly, there are not so many really good projects around. I mean, they are, but not in the amount we had in 2017. But they're still coming. You will see there is there some really good projects in the pipeline can't tell you now, but there are some really good projects still coming. And I hope they're coming. Because what I always say, you know, you should embrace the protocol developments because the protocol developments, they are, they are planting the seeds for the decentralized world because all the thinking, all the development comes from there. Cool. Yeah. So non-token sale crypto projects, do they also choose Switzerland as a base? Actually, yes. Switzerland offers uh, some advantage uh, for uh, such projects. It's all about such an infrastructure. If you talk about such DLT or blockchain infrastructures, it's, it's all about trust. It's, and trust is a very important issue. So if you add some other services to run, let's say an application or take the example of a, of a wallet service provider, you have there a physical storage. Where do you want to have your physical storage? You want to have a physical storage in a very stable jurisdiction. Or if you have, let's say, exchange or transaction activities, 
which have a potential to be taxed, VAT taxing and things like this. You want to have it in a jurisdiction with low VAT tax regime. So here, Switzerland kicks in as a jurisdiction which has a trust reputation, and uh, that helped. And, you know, what really helped, and I'm very often being asked, you know, tell me why Switzerland had for such a long time a lead in this space. Switzerland had an advantage, and it was all thanks to Ethereum. The tax authorities, as well as the regulators, they could early start to really deep dive into the technology and to deep dive in the, let's say, specific relevance, either on the tax or legal side. And that was an advantage. So give you an example, if you have to talk to tax authorities to explain them what happens in a token generator or in a token exchange, for example, in Zook, they understand it. They understand the technology. It's easy to access them because they speak more or less the same language. Yeah, so that I would love actually to dive in a little bit there, right? Because when you started, there was no, you know, there was no blockchain regulations or rules in Switzerland, and there was there was no kind of thinking around that. So how has Switzerland evolved as a regulatory environment, crypto space? You know, what kind of guidances, rules, or regulations have you know have been put forth? And yeah, how has that sort of changed the uh, the environment one encounters today? First, um, what helped is that Switzerland, before this blockchain wave hit Switzerland, Switzerland has a very liberal legal system. That was is one thing which helped. And secondly, in the especially in the financial market regulation side, Switzerland has a very formal approach in a way that either it is a security or it is not. So this kind of more like functional vague description, which we more have in the US, in the USA, which makes sense. But on the other hand, it's also very difficult to get a clear opinion of whether something is or is not a security. Here we had an advantage in Switzerland. Now, the second advantage which we had, uh, and which was also a little bit surprised to me because I didn't see it uh, in earlier examples in a way like I saw it with on the, on the blockchain space, especially in 2014, that was the early in the early days of DLT in Switzerland, the Swiss government issued a report on Bitcoin. So that what they did is about on 70 or close to 100 pages, they made an evaluation on different legal aspects, you know, to what extent, you know, a Bitcoin is regulated or not regulated or Bitcoin activities are or are not regulated in Switzerland. So that was a starting point that some of the departments at the government were starting to think and were starting to write about these new protocols. And then, you know, they follow, they were following the whole developments and in early 2008, the uh, Financial Market Authority issued the ICO guidelines issuing or let's say proposing three types of tokens and that helped all this helped also a little bit to guide all the projects and the market in the right direction and was very helpful and finally what was really remarkable in 2018 in December the government issued a second report on DLT infrastructure and the law and relevance uh, on all different kinds of, uh, of laws in Switzerland. And this was a very interesting report. This report set the basis of a legislation project, which kicked off in March 2019 by issuing a draft on a new DLT law. And not only a new DLT law, but also a DLT, maybe I'm overstating a bit, but a DLT security and a DLT marketplace license. So this, in very fast speed, the government proposed a new law. There was six or eight weeks time to comment these new proposals by the industries, which we did. And now it's back to the government to finalize uh, the proposal. And we hopefully, hopefully, uh, we will have a the fully proposed new draft, which then has to go to parliament by the beginning of next year, or let's say the second quarter of next year. So Switzerland is getting ready to set the legal basis for uh, DLT applications. Very good movement, but for me, a little bit still too slow. So it should be faster, but it's a good speed for Switzerland. For people who know Switzerland, you know, this is really already high speed, so I don't want to criticize a lot, but just my message to all the politicians, you know, we need it. Please work. We need it fast. So do you think in Switzerland, the main benefit is having regulatory clarity 
or other laws that are being passed also more permissive than elsewhere? The good side is that we have more regulatory clarity. That's the good side. Let's say the negative side is we have some unclear situations, especially on the civil law side, on the transfer of rights based on a DLT transaction. Here we have a an unclear situation under Swiss law, and here it's a little bit disadvantage. And the new DLT securities tries to now overcome this gap on the Swiss law. That's a little bit downside. On, and what I also think is what is a potential risk in Switzerland is that as a small country, we always need to be very careful uh, that we are not uh, doing something which is, uh, let's say, outside of an international standard because the big countries might then increase pressure on us. So to sum it up, I think Switzerland is on the good path uh, to adapt its regulation to all these new technology, to the new technologies, but the speed is, as I said, a little bit too slow. So Finma, the Swiss Financial Market Supervisory Authority, they recently issued a stablecoin guidance, right? Yep. So from my reading, it divides stablecoins into different classes and that determines how they will be treated by the law. This is particularly interesting, one, because stablecoins, you know, building block of open and decentralized finance. And secondly, Libra is also based out of Switzerland. So how would you sum up guidance and what do you think the consequences are? The guidance are very generic. The guidance are very generic. Uh, is, is They contain a certain discussion. So let's say it's more like an a overall view on what different kind of potential stable coin structure do exist and Finma has or does already know and they want to make clear as well to what would be their regulatory assessment of a stable coin concept as presented by the Libra Association. So I think these would be the two main information parts which they wanted to show. Now, on the more generic part, you know, it's very difficult also to give a guideline here because, you know, it's not so easy to define what a stable coin is. There are so many different concepts of stable coins. And if you read the guidelines or let's say the guidelines of FINMA, what they say basically is that every project has to be assessed separately because it's really depending on the detailed structure of such a stablecoin concept, whether it is a payment token or it is already a fund structure like a collective investment scheme or whether it falls into a payment system under a financial market regulatory license. It really depends on how such a stable concept is set up. I was recently in Switzerland and speaking with a few different lawyers. I, I spoke about it with you also briefly once. And many people mentioned this idea of an asset token in Switzerland, which I think is considered a security there. And, you know, people are probably familiar with the, the U.S. understanding of securities, or at least the, the sort of common one where you have this Howey test. But this asset token seems to be something quite different, where you basically say, okay, if there's a token that's represents a claim to an underlying asset, then this is an asset token. And of course, it makes perfect sense. Like if, you know, let's say I have a token, it represents a claim to some sort of gold that somebody holds or real estate, or, you know, some off-chain asset that's custodied. Of course, it makes sense that this is like something that would be regulated. But I'm curious how that plays into the entire decentralized finance space. So if you have a, let's say, a smart contract that's custodying something, doing something, and then you have a token that kind of represents a claim there. And an example could be compound, right? So you can put Ether into compound and then it's going to be lent out. And compound gives you this other token, the C token, which represents the Ether that's locked up and the accrued interest. So do you think those will, will end up being regulated in Switzerland? And if so, what do you think that will mean for how sort of decentralized finance as a broader space will end up being looked at by regulators? Again, first of all, the term asset token is not any legislation which we have in Switzerland. So asset token is something which is used 
has was used first time by Filma uh, for the, for their interpretive notes, which they issued in uh, 2018. So, and it's very difficult to say what is really an asset token. What we do at MME, we are we differentiate between BCP ones and BCP two. BCP one is a token which does not have any counterparty. The BCP2 is a counterparty, uh, is a token which is issued in a counterparty context, which might give you or can give you a claim against the counterparty, either because the token itself does in, in the token itself that such a right is embodied or embodied, or the token is used as, a, let's say, an instruction and or booking of such a, a right in another legal context. So it's very difficult to, to define what is an asset token. For example, if you have a payment token, such a payment token can also have a claim against the counterparty, but the functionality is more a payment than having it as an asset, you know, because the asset token has more like, you know, you, you are invested and they keep it as an asset on my balance sheet. Now, if you look how the Bitcoin has developed, the Bitcoin as a what we call BCP1, a counterparty-less token, uh, used to be a, a payment token. And now when you see, you know, for payment purpose to use a Bitcoin, slow, very expensive, high price volatility. So I would regard now a Bitcoin more like an asset token. So I want what I want to tell you or want to show you, it's very difficult to use these kind of undefined terms, uh, which you use then afterwards to make a regulatory qualification. For me, again, if we, if I qualify a token and you can go, go to uh, on our website, you see how, how our functional approach is on the qualification of tokens. You have to go into and dive into the clear functionality of such a token and assess it in the counterparty context. Only if you do that. Then you can actually draw a quite a conclusion on what kind of quality um, or qualification such a token has. I agree with you. In Switzerland, there is a tendency to qualify such tokens if they have a counterparty context too easily as a security. And that's what I exactly mean if you use what you know to a technology which is new. And you know, at the time, the legislator was drafting a law qualifying something as a security. They would not even think of something like a token at that time. So I'll give you an example. If you say, okay, I issue a share, which gives you also a counterparty, right? Because you have shareholders, rights, And you say, okay, is this a security? Yes or no? I would say, yes, it's security. Now, if you issue a token, which gives you access to a ski resort to get it as a ticket for a one-day pass up in the mountains. Now, it's a counterparty, right? You can use it as an asset. Yes, you can. But is it a security? Is it security as it was the idea of the, of the legislator when they were draft, drafting the security laws? I doubt it. So my message is, you know, we need to be more liberal and clear also say, okay, to, to what extent do we want to have it regulated as an as, as, as want to have it qualified as a security and whatnot? Because the moment we qualify such a token as security, the secondary market looks completely different because you only can deal with securities if you have a certain license. So yes, there is a tendency to go back to centralization by a qualification of the token. So, so you're moving for us or for Switzerland to be less formulaic about how to classify these tokens. No, I mean to take also a little bit a, a reasonable approach to say, okay, Yes, according to our framework, which is pre-existing, it could be regarded as security, but in the context of the specific use, it's definitely not. And here, that's the dilemma in which we are. Now, if you ask a regulator, you know, they sometimes, you know, or there is a moment they have to actually issue a policy or set the policy to say, shall we now qualify it as security or not? And for us, you know, as advisor, you know, we, it's sometimes difficult to advise the clients because we see a certain tendency and also a certain dilemma on the regulator side. And that's why I say, you know, we need to move. Either we have a very liberal approach by the regulators, which lately there is not a tendency if you see what happens after 2008. So financial markets tend to be a little bit overregulated. 
On the other hand, you know, uh, we would like to have also an open-minded approach how to deal with, with, with these aspects, uh, with asset tokens or counterparty tokens, which are clearly not the securities as it was the idea of the old lawmakers. So let's put this a little bit in the context of other jurisdictions. So obviously Switzerland was super early to the blockchain party, but now other countries are moving in. So Liechtenstein, Malta, Luxembourg, even Germany to a certain Germany. extent. My big surprise, um, <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> What's your take on this? Um, what do you think will happen uh, in the longer run on a global scale? You see some tendency of standardization. Uh, I come to this point later on. But I'm so happy that the smaller jurisdictions like Malta, Gibraltar and the Principality of Liechtenstein, they, they started to do, to pilot, to move. Very good, you know. And, you know, they're The bigger jurisdictions, they love a little bit about, you know, these are the offshore jurisdictions, small ones that try to be attractive and love about these these guys. But I think I'm very proud of them that they start to do it. They start to think with all these concepts. Thank you to all these smaller jurisdictions. It will be difficult for them, you know, because if the big ones move in and they get a bit more liberal, they will have a more a better market. And... That's what I always say when I talk, when I'm talking to politicians and stakeholders here in Switzerland. You see, okay, guys, look what the smallers are doing, but also have an eye open to the bigger ones. As you mentioned, Frederica, Germany, you know, they actually implement now in the enforcement of the fifth AML uh, directive. You know, they, they, they set up a new legislation, which probably comes into force at the first of January 2020 which is a real advantage for the German DLT um, community. So I said, you know, and France, you know, France, they easily, I think in one, as a one or two pager, they made it clear that securities can be transferred on a DLT infrastructure, something which in Switzerland is not really happening at the moment. So brilliant. And I think the UK are also working on something. Singapore and, and China, they are moving also very fast. The U.S. is a little bit defining which authority is, is responsible for what. So we'll probably have to wait a little bit more. But once the U.S. is settled as well, you know, and I believe they will be settled soon because they see the market. Yeah, there will be some pressure. There will be some pressure around uh, for other jurisdictions. Now, coming back to your question, whether or not we see some standardization, FATF uh, in the summer issuing uh, the, uh, or let's say, Changing recommendation 16, you know, also having now the VASPs a bit more clearly defined and, uh, and also implementing the travel rules for blockchain transactions, they start to do some standardization for the DLT uh, service uh, um, sector. So we see already some international standardization now limited to the AML part. Yeah, so I'm very curious how that is going to play out, right? Because you see, of course, that blockchain and cryptocurrencies and decentralized technologies are also very threatening, right? You have the existing nation states and especially, let's say, the very large states like the United States or maybe the European Union, you know, that benefit tremendously from having uh, a sort of global control and reach of having... Uh, their financial system there, having maybe also the US dollar as a global currency. So there's a lot of boost. And I'm curious, don't, won't they try to kind of clamp down on Bitcoin or try, or in, in cryptocurrencies and try to use regulations as a way of doing that? And then also trying to, you know, for example, put pressure on these small countries, whether it's Liechtenstein or whether it's Switzerland to, you know, sort of harmonize and, you know, make a joint effort at regulation? Do you, do you think there's a chance of that happening? I think it's you or the younger generation. That's also, also something which amazed me when I was talking to Vitalik, you know, uh, for the first time. He was also a little bit an eye-opener because my generation, you know, we, I mean, we were born in a more free world But step by step, we experience that, you know, based on different considerations, you know, market failures, tax evasion and whatever, it got more and more 
compliance was taking over business activity and we had new legislations, especially Switzerland, for example, after 2008 adopted the, or let's say copied some of the European financial market regulations in a way which implemented new laws, which we never knew before in Switzerland. So we were all born in this tendency, you know, to have more and more and more and more regulation. And now your generation coming up, you have more like a sense, hey guys, we have the technology that we can be we can free. We can actually now transact and change values without asking the bank, without even asking the government to do that. And this is really sexy and is actually unleashing something which we have in our DNA. It's freedom. We want to be free. We don't want to actually be told what to do. And, and, and all this protective way of doing regulation that you have a government which starts to think for you what kind of laws we now to have to implement in order to protect our citizens. The younger generations, they don't want it because they have probably a bit more enlightened. They have more education than we had at that time. You have more, let's say, sense of freedom. And I hope, because you will be the next generation of politicians, of, of people ruling the world. So I hope you finally will run a more liberal world in the future. And uh, because actually I myself, you know, I already, when I'm asking myself, you know, I'm, yeah, I already gave in a little bit on the, all this development of new laws and uh, what we need and how we want to protect and how we should protect in other words. Now, coming back to your question regarding really attack on, on a Bitcoin protocol or Libra, there are two different things. I think the world will be liberal to protocols. Because protocols, I think what I have seen in the in the past, it's an interesting piece of technology, and tokens like uh, nat real native tokens, which you use for the use of such a protocols, governments they are not afraid of such kind of tokens, even if they can be used for payments and exchange and things like this, and even if they grow. However, if you see projects like uh, Libra, especially if they team up with tech giants. Now, already having a, such a huge community base and you see what the potential of technology combined with such a huge, huge community base can do, then it gets dangerous and then governments will actually start to uh, interfere, which they did in the Libra concept. You know, you have seen what all the governments, uh, how they reacted, uh, how negative the response was to such a project. Would you agree that governments try to preserve their own controls under the guise of consumer protection? Consumer protection is one thing. I mean, it's also consumer and investor protection. But on the other hand, you know, and I think this is, yes, that there is a concern. I think this is a concern which also can, can be overcome by time. But I think the concern of the governments is to losing the control over their own currency. That's, I think, their main concern. So take, for example, Venezuela. You would have Libra in Venezuela. You would have an even a more fast-running uh, uh, inflation. Nobody would use uh, the local currency anymore if you had a possibility to use a stable currency uh, issued by somebody else. So here you lose every possible control mechanism of a national bank if you would allow such a system, especially if such a system would run on such a large scale, you know, using the whole infrastructure, community infrastructure of a tech giant. So I think here governments, they don't want, because they would lose complete control on, on, on a very, very important, let's say, steering mechanism of the government economic. So one of the things besides, you know, all of the legal work you've done, right, is you've also been fairly entrepreneurial and you co-founded a bank named Signum that I think got a full banking license just a few months ago. So tell us a little bit, like, how did you end up working on Signum and what is Signum about? Actually, Brian, I was my whole life entrepreneurial because actually this is now family DNA. So it was for me as from school on clear that I will have my own company. And I was never thinking of a law firm, but you know, that was clear. I will have, I want to be my own boss from the beginning. Why um, Signum? Signum came out of, of what we have seen uh, in 2016, 17, that if you want to make, let's say, protocol 
or protocol tokens bankable, you need to have a bank able to receive, hold, and transfer such protocol tokens. If you do not have this kind of banking layer installed, institutional investors will never touch or will hardly ever touch uh, Bitcoin or Ethers or the ripples of the world. So that was what we have seen. And you need to have a banking layer. You need to create a banking layer and a very secure fiat gateway close to holding such uh, assets. That was actually the starting point. And not only did the counterparty less tokens, but you know, also need to have an infrastructure for the security tokens. And this was because we have seen already the STOs upcoming and the STO wave. Uh, which also then started to go down a little bit uh, because all everybody saw the risk or let's say the, the, the challenge of having a secondary market, licensed secondary market infrastructure. So both on the side of the counterless po- uh, protocol token as well as on the uh, security token, we saw a need to build a regulated licensed infrastructure. And that was the reason why we said, okay, let's try to do it in Switzerland and start in Switzerland. So Signum actually holds two banking licenses or banking licenses in two jurisdictions, Switzerland and Singapore. That's an interesting choice of location. Why Singapore? We only hold one banking license in Switzerland and the Capital Market Service license, the CMS license in Singapore. Now you're asking, coming back to your question, why did these two um, jurisdictions? We think that Switzerland is a solid trust basis for a banking service. And that's why we start in Switzerland. We also decided we'll start in Switzerland wider Europe. And we think that the future market is not only, but probably in next phase, predominantly in Asia. Because we have seen Asia, they are moving very fast forward. And that was the reason why we explored Singapore. And actually, As a matter of detail, we found that the whole Signum project was started in Singapore during the FinTech Festival 2017. One thing that's very impressive is, yeah, so you mentioned only it started in 2017. There's a full banking license. I remember at one point, like years ago, looking at, you know, new banks being licensed in the US. And it basically seems almost impossible there to create a new bank. How was that process to get a banking license? How much work was that? How much resources had to go into that? It was actually uh, a a one-year work with a lot of resources. I would say there were about 20, 30 people working all the time to set up such uh, infrastructure, not only from a paperwork side, but also you had to create a whole technology stack. At the same time, you were applying for a banking license, even without knowing whether or not you will get one. We had two main working streams. We had, the, we had the regulatory working stream and just closely working behind the regulatory working stream, we had the technology working stream, setting up all the technology to be able to pass all the security audits, which were a pre-requirement then finally for the license. In the summer 2018, we started with the launch of the project, the real, I mean, license project. And Thanks to really the, the management team, this is uh, Matthias uh, Imfeld and Manuel Krieger, they, these two guys, they are as co-CEO, they were responsible for the whole management of the project and the whole team. And I must tell you, I'm so proud that we have a multi-jurisdictional, sensational team working on it and still working on it. Thanks to this young team, all young guys, highly educated team, it was able to have these, all these resources available to file and, and submit all these documents. In addition, I must also say we were so happy that also the Financial Market Authority was quite open to learn and was quite open to work together with us. So we had many workshops with them. We could develop banking custody solutions. We could work uh, with them on AML solutions. And that was very, very helpful. So also during the application process, Thanks to these workshops, we could slightly adapt our application. We could also then adapt the technology to see, okay, this is probably is going in the direction they want. So that was a very, very, very intensive period. Uh, and I think some of the team members, they worked seven days a week. 
that sounds like a really agile process or regulator. You also raised an impressive seed round, right? Yes, we had a very impressive round. We were surprised ourselves, I must say. Signum entered into a strategic partnership with um, Deutsche Börse and Swisscom to build a trusted digital asset ecosystem. What is the vision? At what stage is uh, this at? I mean, the press was writing a bit too much. You know, we were built a new infrastructure. It was actually not the idea to build a new infrastructure. The idea was to team up, to think. It was more like teaming up to think what is necessary to make the best use of the technology for the financial markets of the future. We had Swisscom, we had Deutsche Börse, we had Signum, and uh, all these companies who were sending the most, the, the brightest guys to think about well, how the infrastructure could look like. But it was not the idea that we will create together a huge market infrastructure. It was sometimes a little bit in the press, you know, oh, wow, these three companies are coming together to build a new marketplace. No, that was not the idea. It was the idea because, you know, you had Swisscom as a technology company, you had Signum as a bank, you have Deutsche Börse as a market infrastructure service provider. So actually what for us, let's say the idea was of, of the partnership was to learn from each other and take back for each of the company what is important to be successful in the future. The work will go on. We will have several projects. We had one project uh, now this uh, summer. We had a POC, an instant settlement of a Swiss franc token with a Swiss share in a banking environment. And that was very nice. So we had a, a ring transaction uh, around four banks sending uh, money on a DLT infrastructure on one side and sending and settled the share transaction at the same time. So these are the projects we will have in future, but it's really like we'll have the projects to learn and then everybody goes back and uh, executes whatever things uh, is useful for their own operation. What do you think are the, the kind of use cases or the products that are most needed? One thing would be maybe there's doing accounts for crypto companies. There is, you know, maybe doing custody for funds. What are some of the possibilities and products that Signum could pursue in the future that you're most excited about? As you said, you know, it's the custody and transfer services and gateway services for all the protocol token world. This is already a huge business as such, you know, and do it more e efficiently, transparent and, and secure. That's one business line. The second business line, when we're changing into the BCP2, what we call the security tokens, here, you can help as a bank on an issuing process, then also on issuing uh, digital money. There can be a business case or will be a business case and on the custodian services, that, for example, that you say, okay, we have in physical custody a, a, some, an asset and we tokenize now these assets. So as Swiss Signum Bank, we have three token engine. We have one token engine with three token classes. One is the payment token, the other one is the equity token, and the other one is the custody token, which we'll issue. And I think these three categories will serve as a first product uh, in the market. However, what we see, we are very early. Our all secondary market, I mean, this, the necessary secondary market infrastructure at the moment does not exist. SIX is, is also working on it, the Swiss stock exchange, but it's not ready yet. Even if we have the products, you know, available, there will be difficulties to get access to licensed secondary market infrastructure on the security token side. But it will come. It will come. You're also involved in a number of projects that are kind of adjacent to this or, you know, complement this in some way, shapes. So one of them is Dora, which uh, tokenizes Swiss uh, SMEs and startups. Then there's Custodigit, which is uh, exactly what it sounds like, um, a custody solution, and KYC Spider, which obviously is also a KYC solution. How did this come about? So how did you come to spin these up as well? KYC Spider is a very old project. I founded KYC Spider in 2003 already with a spin-off of the Federal Technical High School. 
It's an AI solution, so we were spidering big data and uh, extracting compliance-relevant information and made them available for the financial in industry. So we started there, and now we are extracting such information on the D uh, we merge DLT compliance-relevant information from DLT transaction with all style compliance information. That's what we do now in KYC Spider. It was more like a pilot. It's not a big company. We earn a little bit there, but it's a very interesting technology pilot, which is now running for many, many years already and has a lot of clients. Dora was actually the idea. We started with Dora in 2016. So it's very early already. We had the idea to use now because we saw what the uh, BCP1, the protocol world can do. And then we said, okay, now we have the smart contracts. We use a smart contract as a share registry. Let's see what we can do. And this is, was when we started with Dora and, and Swisscom as a also government, half government owned company was very interested. And that's why we started to design it. I provided the first legal concept as well as funding. 2016, nobody wanted to fund it, you know, at the beginning, you know, because, yeah, we don't need that. It's what do you talk about? It's a very interesting, a very interesting concept. So the issuing of shares on a blockchain infrastructure. Here, still some regulatory challenges, but we will come around it. Now, Costa Digit was another project which we already were also discussed with Swisscom many, many, many years ago already. In 2015, we discussed, you know, what could be a potential business case also for Switzerland in the future of digital assets. And I said, look, if you look at the structure of a digital asset, you have the protocol consensus level, but you have also the custody of the private key level. So here you have a physical touchdown and the physical touchdown, you know, is something which is also from a regulatory security and also from a trust uh, side, very relevant. I said, you know, who else than a trusted half government owned Swiss company could better place a role here than Swisscom, you know? So I think you should invest in a, in a costly solution. And I helped them a little bit design also how they should do it, that such a costly solution can be used in a banking environment. How do you deal with um, conflicts of interest? That's the reason why I'm not sitting in the board anymore of Daura. Because, you know, as a board member of, of a regulated bank, you're not allowed to be in, you, you have certain strict governance rules and uh, every process or let's say every transaction which involves two companies in which I'm involved, I have to step aside. I'm not allowed to decide, which hurts sometimes because, you know, uh, <laughs> I would be more in favor of projects, but, you know, it's good. It's governance. It, the rules exist and you know how to apply it. So there's another Swiss crypto bank that got a license the same week as Signum uh, named Seba Crypto. How does Signum distinguish itself from Seba Crypto or does it not have to? I think from the offering, we offer more or less the same. What the difference is, is Seba is sitting on an infrastructure of a bank. We have created the whole technical infrastructure ourselves. So I think this is one of the major differences. We are maybe more a tech company and we have more tech involved in our project than uh, Seba. You know, the blockchain space, I think, is still at its its beginnings, right? We, we don't have yet, uh, for example, applications that are really used, you know, on a daily basis by millions of people. And, you know, it's so still, there's a long way to go. When you look at, what the future holds for blockchain, you know, the next 10 years, the next 20 years, what is your kind of greatest hope of the change that will bring to the world? And what are some fears you have around how it could all play out as well? One of the, let's say, beautiful architectural elements of a blockchain application is that you really can hold yourself assets and you can transfer these assets I mean, yes, you would, might be need to have a custody solution or a wallet service provider for security reasons, but finally you get, you as a user, you get access and you can directly transfer. So it's really a 
a possibility that you directly can hold something without any additional, let's say, balance sheet contamination or, or intermediary. And I think this is an incredible development, this kind of democratization of services or, or access or, or holding property digitally represented. I hope that we will have a lot of digitally represented assets which you can directly hold and that your asset or your property is protected. That's what I hope in the future and that we can have all different kinds of assets on the blockchain. Now, what is my fear? My fear is that because it's so efficient that everything can be traded, that it will be too much of financial market regulation contaminated. That's a little bit my fear, that we have a lot of laws which we apply unnecessarily and we, again, restrict ourselves. That's what, I'm, what my fear is. My hope is that we have an, more like an open society, open for technology. And yes, if there are any misuses, we should be strongly fighting against such misuses, but not really covering every, every activity under a, a very burdensome and sometimes stupid regulation. Well, I hope that you're going to be right and it's going to turn out like that and bring much more freedom and autonomy to the world and not to end up being uh, crippled by too much regulation. Thanks so much for joining us and sharing about uh, all the exciting things you're working on. I'm really excited to see how, you know, Signum and MME and Switzerland as a jurisdiction will evolve. Hey, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Friedrike. It was a nice talk. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.